Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure. Um, so yeah, so what I'll, I'll do between today is giving you an overview of the JAM macroeconomic approach um, and using some case studies uh, in Tunisia, Morocco, in, in Colombia. Um, and yeah, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, uh, and I look forward to the discussion afterwards. So um, the, the GEM approach, so AFD is a French development agency, so, so um, it's a bank uh, that does uh, public lending to uh, foreign countries, but also um, uh, provides uh, technical support. And part of this uh, technical support is this GEM research project that is developed in-house. And I think it's very peculiar. And if you look at, uh, at the way uh, development agencies work, usually what they do is they finance uh, consultants to do something. And here, uh, AFD decided to develop the model in-house. And I think it's crucial if you really want to have a public policy debate um, around transitions in general, you have to have someone who actually is engaged in, in discussing uh, with the ministries, with the academia in different countries. And so, so um, yeah, the, the, I think it's important to have this, this the, to, to, to be talking from, directly from the, the development agency and not as a consultant to a project. Um, and so the approach is uh, 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 aiming to contribute to the debates around transition in general, uh, just transitions. Um, and of course, we will uh, uh, focus on, on developing economies. Um, and one of the key aspects of what we have uh, developed is that we are using a strong sustainability approach. Strong sustainability is the idea that you don't have a priori a substitution possible between natural capital, natural objectives, social objectives, and economic objectives. So, so you cannot just substitute one for the other. You cannot monetize nature or social aspects and just say, oh, it's okay, I will destroy that forest, but because my income is growing, I'm fine. Or uh, because I have high unemployment because my income is growing, it's fine. The idea is to say, okay, if you really are, are, are serious about sustainable development, you should aim to have all of the objective at once and not one versus the other. Um, and, and the fact that a priori you reject substitu substitution doesn't mean that it's not possible at all time, but you have to have technologies, you have to have options that show that it is possible to substitute. I mean, the idea of decoupling CO2 emission and GDP, that's a substitution. You're, you're saying, okay, I'm reducing my, imp my environmental impact, and at the same time I'm growing, uh, uh, my GDP is growing, whether you believe that's possible, that's a proof of substitution. But you have to, you have to prove it and not just assume it ex ante. Um, and this is why you will see that, that because we have this strong sustainability approach, it basically implies that you have to have multidisciplinary approach. You have to have biophysical vision of what is a transition combined with social aspects, combined with economic uh, aspects. And you cannot just have an economic perspective on these. Uh, and you will see that all of the models that, that we have developed are trying to do this by explicitly representing the biophysical sphere and then having an economic dynamics on top of it, but not just an economic dynamic. Um, and then the second point I wanted to say is that um, it is developed with a name of looking at developing economies, which imply that the tools that we have in mind will concentrate on the macroeconomic characteristic of developing economies, the importance of balance of payment and the importance of trade, the importance of exchange rate dynamics, the importance of uh, having an economy that is uh, still developing in terms of uh, industrial network or in terms of dependency to imports for capital goods and so on. So you'll see that uh, there's a strong focus and we developed a model that actually aims at capturing what is relevant from a macroeconomic perspective for developing and emerging economies. We have two types of model. I will concentrate on the GEM model. The ST model is, uh, we, have, we are giving a course on, on input-output models and, and that's something, uh, you, I mean, it's, it's part of the, I can't remember, we'll track in, in Epoch, but it's, it's part of the course that AFD is giving. Here, I'll, I'll be speaking about GEM in general and we have like world model, which are more toy models and then country models. And I will talk about these uh, country models in a, in a moment. Um, just to, to go back to the idea of strong sustainability, it's, it's a debate that emerged uh, in, the, in the 70s uh, when you had the limits to growth uh, report mm -hmm. by uh, Meadows and, and the response that the economists gave to Meadows. I don't know if you follow that debate. It's really interesting when you look at it. So Meadows comes and says, oh, you know, we, have, we are in trouble. Uh, the dynamics that, we, that are uh, behind the, 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 the environmental dynamics that are behind our economic growth 
will have to stop, implies that at some point we will have a collapse of the economy and, and we should change, hence change our, our approach. And the response by the economic community in general was, oh, but Meadows is not an economist, he doesn't understand. And economists actually understand better this. If you have technical change, if you have money and prices, then actually Meadows is completely wrong. Unfortunately, Meadows is the only person that actually had projections which are more than 40 years old and are still spot on. There's, I, I, I beg of you, try to find any economic model that actually is good at producing forecasts for 40 years and not being wrong. There's, there's no one. And if you do find, please let me know. Um, and so, so, so then the response, but you have like, uh, people like Nordos, of course, but also Stiglitz saying, well, Meadows is wrong. And what is important is, yeah, we can change our models. We will add natural capital in our growth model, but then you can substitute between them. So that implies that you can reduce to very little uh, value your natural capital, but if you cap your, your physical capital or if your social capital is growing faster, it's fine because you can compensate for the lack of natural capital. And that's, that's when you have weak sustainability and strong sustainability emerging. The, the, the responses to Nordos by Stiglitz, Nordos, uh, I'm sorry, to Meadows by, 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 Meadow, by Nordos and, and, and Stiglitz are the weak sustainability, and then there's the strong sustainability by people like Dali, that uh, Herman Dali, who died last year, uh, and others. They were saying, no, you cannot substitute between natural capital and, and economic capital, and, and, and that's the strong sustainability approach. Uh, and of course, there's many, there's many, uh, there are many nuances of, of strong sustainability uh, uh, in between, and, and there's a large, large literature on this. The approach of AFD is, as I said, a priori, you, do, you refuse substitutability between natural capital, social capital, and environment, and, and economic capital. But you can have, in certain cases, substitution if you can prove it exists. That doesn't mean there is no arbitrage. We are aware that as policymakers, sometimes because you work in a, con a constrained budget, or sometimes because uh, there are obvious tensions between social dynamics and environmental dynamics, that doesn't mean you don't have an arbitrage necessary. And in the current situation, uh, even though no uh, developing or emerging, actually even developed economy would say, we believe in degrowth, that doesn't mean it cannot happen. It's just that politically it's difficult to justify it right now, but, but hopefully with time, yet there might be discussion about moving away from this, this pure growth dependency. That's a substitution. And then once you accept that you cannot have substitution, that means you have to have multidimensional analysis. You have to look at the different impacts that economic activity have. It implies having impact on, 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 on nature, having impacts on, on social uh, impacts such as uh, inequality, multidimensional inequality, poverty, and so on and so forth. So you have to create a dialogue where economics is not the core. Economics is one brick within the entire analysis and where um, you can measure differently different sustainability dynamics. Um, and so, so that's complicated because from an academic perspective, usually you publish in economic journals or you publish in nature journal or you publish in sociology, sociology journals. And, and building this multidimensional uh, uh, and, and multidisciplinary approach is actually quite uh, difficult, and, but, but still it's fundamental if you really want to achieve this strong sustainability approach. But then once you have this, this multidimensional uh, uh, analysis, as I was saying, there is also the need to actually construct a desirable outcome. Uh, because if you take the strong sustainability to, the, to, to its limit, fundamentally it says that if you don't want to have any impact on the environment, there's basically no human, human life on this. Because by definition, economic activities and, and human activities will have an impact. So the question is, how do you define what is a desirable state? How do you, you define the, the target and the way towards the target that, is, uh, that as a society we want to go to? And this is where we, we think we want to work on the idea of the social construct, the idea of how do we as human beings develop this endpoint and these trajectories or the trajectories that could lead to this endpoint. And so having participatory approach, having uh, 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 approaches as the commons, where you discuss uh, 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 governance uh, structure that allow us to define the endpoint and the trajectories that go there. And so, so you will see that, that more and more, and this is something we have started recently, uh, as, as macro uh, modelers, we're trying to engage also with different representation of the society in where we work 
to ensure that there's an ownership of both the model and the trajectories that we can test and building scenarios together and so on and so forth. Um, and in the case of Colombia, I'll mention this at the end, we are starting to do a serious games where we want to play with the different actors that are on the table and say, okay, let's say Colombia has to get out of fossil fuel dependency. How do we do this? What does it imply for petroleros, petroleros? How does it imply for trade unions? What does it imply for the finance ministers? And having a game that allows us to then test different scenarios. And there's plenty of other examples like that where, where you can develop a participatory approach to this transition, even from a macro perspective. Um, let me go a bit, and, and uh, you'll have a bit, we'll have a bit of a, of a financial, uh, sorry, of a modeling uh, uh, description here. So the, the GEM approach uh, is based on these, these, uh, these uh, aspects. So the first one is, we believe it's extremely important to understand the dynamics between the real sector and the financial sector. If you look at most of the macro uh, uh, approach and all of the IIMs and so on and so forth, Finance is either non-existent or it's very limited to an interest rate maybe or sometimes to a budget constraint, but not, nothing more. What we are saying is that when you look at the world in which we live, in every country in the world, the dynamics of finance and its interaction with the real side is extremely important. And actually what we're saying is that there's a, there's a tight interconnection between what happens on the real side and what happens on the financial side, and we want to understand the explicit relationship between the two. So that's one. The second, time, the second aspect is that we work on long-term perspective. So we are there not to forecast. We are there to test different scenarios because there's a lot of uncertainty around these dynamics. There's a lot of complexity. So we know that these models are simplification of the real world. And so we are here to test scenarios. And as I was saying, hopefully in a participatory approach, it's something we are developing. Uh, uh, but so we also know that some of the dynamics we are going to represent are fundamentally different from what happened in the past. So being good at representing the past is not necessarily a good news because the future might be radically different. So you have to have this kind of, how can we find a, a good representation of the history, but also be able to have different dynamics emerging in the future. The third uh, point, and I think that's something which is getting more and more uh, uh, acknowledged for the moment, but it wasn't when we started six years ago, is the fact that fundamentally transitions, energy transition, ecological transitions, are structural change. What we, what we mean by that is that fundamentally it is going to be a radical change of the way in which we produce, the way in which we consume, and the interaction between this consumption and, and our investment structure and the production structure. And as such, you really have to think about how the different sectors that are in an economy are going to change and take into consideration these indirect effects. So if you have one sector disappearing, that implies that all of the producers that were selling intermediate goods to these will also disappear. And as new good sector will appear, the, there will be other indirect effects emerging there. But because we say it's a structural change, that implies that the current situation is also important. We have to take into consideration the institutional design that is currently ongoing and that is actually the mirror image of the structure, uh, structure of production. So we have to, to see this, this, understand that the current situation will explain why is it difficult to have new structure emerging or why certain countries have opportunities that are in specific location and different from other countries. So we have to have this different perspective to transition, implying that the model you develop cannot be one model for everyone. It has to be adapted to the context where you are developing your model. Um, I, I'll be quickly on here, but this is a paper that, that uh, probably some of you have already seen when, when with Guillerme and the, and the colleagues from AFD, where we want to see a priori what are the role that uh, high carbon sectors are playing in an economy. So if you think about uh, uh, what is the role of, an eco of a sector, a sector can produce goods, but as it produces goods, it also generates other socioeconomic indicators. For example, it can generate fiscal revenue for the state because it pays a lot of uh, taxes. It can generate lots of employment because it's very labor intensive. It can generate lots of export because it's actually aiming towards trade. Um, it can generate uh, other financial aspects. So, so understanding that not all sectors are playing the same role in the economy is important to understand that maybe 
it's difficult to get away from that sector because it is currently playing an important role. Or maybe it's easy to actually disappear and have it disappear because it doesn't play much of an important role. And, and understanding the way in which the economies are dependent on these sectors is crucial. And this is what we did there. We were working on trying to understand, can we characterize how the high carbon sector are playing different role in an economy. So here, for example, we have the share of taxes that are generated from what we call sunset industry, that is industry that will disappear. And you see it goes from 0% to 20%, 40%, 60%. And so some countries actually are very dependent on the taxes that are generated by the sectors that will disappear. And here, for example, we look at uh, how much foreign currency dependence, uh, how much foreign currency is generated by the sector. So how much exports are generated by the sectors that will probably disappear in a low carbon transition. And again, the higher, the more that implies, the more you will have trade issues emerging. And so you can see that, for example, here, Angola, Libya, or Algeria are, are very much dependent on fossil fuel or high carbon sectors uh, uh, for the exports, but, but, but others like, like uh, Algeria or even others like Tunisia here, they don't have too much uh, fiscal dependency. So if, um, if these sectors disappear on a fiscal side, it might not be too much of an issue. Angola is, is uh, uh, actually very problematic because it's both dependent on exports and on fiscal revenues. Okay. So that's the tool we have developed, and, and that allows us to understand the different ways in which these, these countries are dependent on fossil fuel and, and can have a strong uh, desire to have a green transition or not. Uh, yeah, and so again, here you have like, and it's interesting because then we can look at uh, 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 whether the dependency is coming directly from these high, uh, the high carbon sectors or are coming also from indirect effect. The fact that it's not necessarily that the, the sector uh, itself, the, the, the sunset sector itself will generate a lot of uh, uh, socioeconomic impact, but it's because it's connected to other sectors that are generating a lot of socioeconomic impact. Uh, I can give you the example of uh, South Africa, which is here. South Africa uh, has a dependency to metals and to carbon fossil fuel here. But a lot of the, the indirect impacts are coming from the fact that the, the, the coal mines are somewhat in the center of the country. There's a lot of transport. And so if the coal mines are, calling, are closing down, all of the transport that are generated to move the coal towards the, 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 the heaven um, will disappear and hence will have a lot of indirect effect. Um, and so this is how we then characterize the different countries. Either they have low exposure, that means they don't really depend on, on sensitive industries, Either they have domestic exposure, that means the, the, the sunset industries are really generating domestic uh, income, employment or fiscal revenues. External, it's really related to, to, to only trade. And then high exposure is when you actually have everything. Uh, and see, for example, South Africa is creating a lot of uh, coal industries, creating a lot of domestic impact. But in the case of uh, Algeria here, it's really about trade. And other countries, it's at Venezuela, for example, is really about uh, both domestic and, 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 um, and uh, foreign effect. Um, all right, I'll, I'll skip this in the interest of time because I'm already 20 minutes in. Uh, so other aspects, I talked about sunset industries uh, in, the case of, uh, 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 in the case of the low carbon transition, but also you have to take into consideration uh, other impacts such as biodiversity. Uh, and so here we're looking at uh, what are the risks and opportunities related to nature in the case of South Africa. Um, and for example, uh, uh, we are looking here, this is what, uh, something we just uh, published uh, a few days ago. And we see, for example, in which municipalities do we have a risk of water shortage? And whether these municipalities also have economic activities that are dependent on water abundance. Okay, because the fact that you have a drought if you, don't, you, if you don't have economic activities which are dependent on water, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, or the other way around. Maybe you, are, you have a lot of economic activities that are dependent on water, but you are in a country where there's a lot of water availability. So it's fine. And so what we do is we combine this nature-based perspective on, on, on uh, ecosystem services, and we look at whether economic, economic activities are dependent on these specific ecosystems. And it's a combination of the two that shows that you have vulnerability emerging. 
And uh, based on this kind of analysis and, and other uh, ecosystem services, then we can see, okay, well, in the case of South Africa, water, uh, uh, water ecosystem services are the most important um, in the case. Uh, at a national level, we can see that 80% of exports are dependent on the existence of these ecosystem services. Um, uh, but also, uh, there's a lot of uh, financial assets that are dependent on these uh, uh, groundwater supply. And then by using the, the municipal analysis, we can look at where will these risks be located and, and which municipalities and which sector are the most vulnerable to the failure of these ecosystem services. So you see that we are really combining this environmental perspective from an ecological perspective and an economic activity, economic perspective to actually have a more reli reliable and relevant analysis of the nature related risks and opportunities. And this is something also you, some of you have seen with the social aspects. Then we can also look at what kind of job are dependent or uh, is it the case that ecosystem services are responding to the failure of market to provide certain uh, necessary goods. So, so what we are doing is we're looking at how municipalities are dependent on ecosystem services to provide basic uh, needs. So it's the, what we call nature contribution to people, right? So the fact that, for example, in certain municipalities, there is no access to electricity or to heating, and hence they use biomass to heat themselves or to cook. Um, or they don't have access to uh, water, uh, uh, urban water, so they actually rely on, on, on rivers to uh, get access to water. And so we can de de determine how much the municipality is dependent on these ecosystem services to provide for the basic goods that the, the market cannot provide. And we see that those that are very dependent actually are located in municipalities, so, sorry, in the municipalities that are very dependent also have a very high multidimensional in the inequality index, implying that it is actually the most vulnerable people that are likely to be impacted by the failure of these ecosystem services. So it's going to increase furthermore the vulnerability of these people uh, in the long run. Um, okay, this was just the introduction, <laughs> 20 minutes. I have two hours, yeah? Um, <laughs> No, so it, but I, I'm doing this because I think it's really important to understand that we have to have this uh, multidisciplinary approach to, to these kind of complex topics. If you only look at economic uh, uh, analysis, you will fail to understand that the failure of provision of ecosystem services, the fact that climate damages are going to have tremendous impact at the biophysical level, you cannot just do like, like NODAS does, say, well, the world at three, the optimal temperature is 3.5 degrees, when all the climatologists are saying 1.5 is already catastrophe, and, and, but from an economic perspective, and if you do a damage function with only economics and temperature, ah, you say 3.5 degrees is the optimum for Earth. It's completely insane. So, and, but the reason why it's insane is not because the economics they're doing is wrong. Yes, it is also that, but it's mostly because they haven't looked at this biophysical perspective of it. All right, so these are the countries where we have uh, a GEM model, and I will now concentrate on the benchmark open economy model. Um, so this is a work that we did uh, with my colleague Devin Yilmaz uh, a few years ago. At the very beginning, we came to AFD, and we said, okay, we sat and we said, for three years we sat, and we said, um, we want to develop the least complicated possible model in order to capture the dynamics of a small open economy in a financialized world. And you'll see that this least complicated model is not so least complicated. It's actually fairly complex. Um, but I think it's important to, to actually, again, you don't have a simple solution to complex problem. You have to sit down seriously and take the time to do the proper analysis. Multidimensional uh, or multidisciplinary, as I was showing, but also in terms of macro. You have to really think into and understand the feedback loops, the different feedback loops you have in your economy, between financial flows, between fiscal decisions, between uh, industrial dynamics, uh, social dynamics, and so on and so forth. So um, the model, uh, you should have them, uh, uh, but I, I will try to explain the, the main feature of, of this model. Well, so first we do what we call a stock flow consistent model. You probably have heard about these models again. Um, the idea is to say we have to understand that the world in which we live is fundamentally a multi-layered uh, network of balance sheet. So, so, so the fact that I own uh, some deposits imply that the bank is indebted towards me 
by providing me this deposit. I gave the money to the bank. The bank says, yeah, yeah, you have a deposit account, and it's using my money to do something else with it. Right? So, so there's a relationship there. The fact that I have a mortgage is the other way around. I went to the bank and says, I want to buy a house. Can you give me a mortgage? And he gave me some money, and I am indebted. But so what happens on my balance sheet will impact the bank's balance sheet. If at some point I go bust and don't have money, and I say, you know what, I won't pay my mortgage anymore, that means the bank will suffer a loss as well. So you have to understand that we are all interconnected through balance sheet interaction. And understanding how the complexity of these dynamics and having, making sure that we understand how, uh, what happens on the public balance sheet or what happens on, on, the, on, the, on the private balance sheet is important. So, so that's why we want to have this feedback mechanism between the different balance sheet and also what explains why balance sheet move, right? You want to understand, am I going indebted because I am investing or am I going indebted because I'm actually uh, uh, spending too much? And it's not the same. And am I being indebted by credit or am I being indebted by emitting bonds or by emitting equity? And again, it won't have the same repercussion in the long run. So this is why we really have to track that down. Uh, and, and do this SFC uh, uh, framework. Oop. What? Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, the second point, important point is that not only is, there, is this important to represent the fact that you have interconnection between balance sheet and the evolution of this balance sheet, you have to, be, to make a difference between what are monetary or, or the fact that these decisions are made by different actors. So money is not only the veil that is on top of the, of the interactions, money is important as itself because it is an institution. And so you have to understand that when you look at, at the national accounts, you always have the investment is equal to saving equality. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an accounting equality, it's always true. But the fact that it's true from an accounting perspective doesn't mean that one is causing the other or the other way around. You can't say that, oh, it's savings that determines investment, or no, it's investment that determines savings. What happens is that those that are deciding to invest are not the same that those that are deciding to, to save. So yeah, of course, because we are in an accounting framework and because we are living in an interconnected world, in the end, you will have this equality holding. But that doesn't mean that, that um, you can always use that equality as, as such. You have to explain what determines the decision to save and what determines the decision to invest. And, uh, and, and this is why you have to have this monetary representation of the economy. Because if you only look at the real side and you only look at, okay, this is my saving decision from the real side, then you don't know who wants to invest. Or if you only look at the investment decision, you don't know who wants to save. So you really have to have this, this distinction between the two. And, and this is not uh, something that, that we are the first one to say. There's a lot of literature on this. Uh, so so I, I invite you to go into, into this, in this in, uh, uh, literature. But it's really important to understand that, that you have to have a, money, a monetary economy with banking and finance. Not only the stock for consistency, but also an explicit representation of who decides to invest and who decides to save. Um, and it's particularly true in, in, in developing and emerging economies because in many cases there is a dependency to international financial flows to compensate part of the investment decision. And, so, so, and, and we've seen this in the, in the midst of the COVID crisis, there was lots of financial international flows leaving the emerging economies and creating a crisis there even before they've had even COVID cases there. I was in Colombia and I remember seeing that the economy, like, like financial flows were leaving the economy and there was no single COVID uh, cases already there, but the financial market was already anticipating this. And by doing this, they were creating pressure on the peso and you had depreciation in many developing economies at that time. Um, right, so, so this is why we have to have this idea of representing uh, financial flows. How does it change? Well. So the way it goes, it's very, it's very similar to what you have in, in, in CGE or other models. So you have your production structure, you explain how once you produce, you distribute wages and taxes, then you have a lot of interest payments. <coughs> Sorry, then you have your decision to, to consume. And usually what you have in a, in a typical uh, macro CGE model is you end here, and then you have a saving that, that basically says, okay, the non-financial corporation want to invest, 
and the government and the, ho no, the households are saving, there's an equality there and you don't have to explain the financial part. What we say is, no, 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 you have to explain if these guys are capable of saving or investing, and then you look, how do they finance themselves? Do they use deposits, debt, equity, insurances, and technical resources, and others? But why is it important? Because the evolution of this will then explain how the interest payments will evolve. So if the government is getting indebted, he will have to pay interest payments afterwards. Or uh, if it's using bonds rather than debt, it will have to pay different type of, of interest payments. Okay, so this is why we have this, this, I was explaining the stock flow consistency, it's making sure that you have a tight accounting framework, but also you have a feedback loop between the evolution of financial flows <coughs> and the evolution of uh, interest. So this is how our model looks like. Uh, 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 let's, this is the Colombian model, and that's how a CGE model looks like. So you can see that fundamentally they are missing 80% of the story, yeah? This is all of the flows that you have to track in our models. This is the typical flows that they track in their model, right? So, so very limited. Another aspect which is very important for us is the idea of disequilibrium. So fundamentally, especially in the case of a transition, if you think about what I was saying at the beginning that it's a structural change, that implies that there will be dynamics where sectors will disappear, other sectors will appear, which fundamentally will imply disequilibrium on markets. Yeah, you can't just say, oh, ex ante, I will have an equilibrium. You have to say, okay, how does the equilibrium, if there is one emerging, how does it emerge? <coughs> so so uh, if, you, if you remember in the history of economic thought, there's basically a debate between Marshall and Walras. Yeah? One saying, oh, when you have this equilibrium, price will do the, 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 the movement so that we have equilibrium. And the other say, no, 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 it's quantity. What we're saying is actually it's both at the same time. Why? The idea is that when a firm observes that it sells more or less than what it had anticipated, there's two reactions you can do. Either you can say, oh, I'm going to raise a bit the prices because I will, I will make more margins, or I will just increase or decrease my production because I don't sell as much as I wanted or I sell more than I wanted, so I will adapt. And actually, what is important to understand is that as they do both, usually they will do both, the overall dynamics will be the combination of these two approach. And, but whether one goes faster than the other will lead to a different outcome, okay? So, so I, will, I will show that into, uh, into, into more uh, explanation. So, say we have aggregate demand which depends on prices and aggregate supply that depends on prices. The way it goes when you have price equilibrating mechanism is that prices will change depending on the distance between what is actually demanded and what is actually supplied. And that speed here is important because it's a characteristic time by which price will change and adapt. And we can show that if the, this beta P, this price, this, this P goes to infinity, then the limit as the price goes to infinity, the speed goes to infinity, implies that the price is an equilibrating price. It's such that aggregate demand is always equal to aggregate supply. This is, I mean, it, it looks like it's, it's relatively complex, it's fairly simple, and it's, it's proven mathematically, okay? So that's when you have a price equilibrating me mechanism. When you have a quantity equilibrating mechanism, it's the same logic. You have a change in equity will depend on the aggregate demand and how much you expect to sell. And so your expected sales will increase when you have more demand than expected sales and it will decrease when you have less demand than expected sales. And again, you can show that uh, uh, when the speed here, the, the, the speed at which the, the quantity adapts to the disequilibrium, if the speed goes to infinity, <laughs> The, equilibrating, the, the, sorry, the, the expected sales is at equilibrium such that aggregate demand is always equal to production. Okay, so these are two different mechanisms. Either you have price equilibrating mechanism or quantity equilibrating mechanism. And when you do macro modeling, usually you choose one or the other. In, in, in mainstream models, it's price. In post keynesian models, it's quantity. What we're doing is we're doing both. So we have a price dynamics which depends on desired price, which depends on markup, and the markup depends on how much inventories to sales you have. So if you accumulate a lot of inventories, you will tend to decrease your price, your markup. If you have lo very little uh, um, uh, inventories, you will tend to increase your markup. That shows that you have a lot of demand or not enough demand. But on top of it, you also have a expected sales mechanism, which is very similar to what I was explaining, where you adapt to how much you have sold to actually determine how much you expect to sell in the future. And the two are taking place at the same time. And you have your two speeds that I was mentioning here and there, and it's the relative speed 
that will determine whether do you have more price dynamics or you have more quantity, but you have the two at the same time. Uh, and that allows us to explain, as you have this equilibrium, you will have both an income distribution effect through prices and a quantity effect through quantity. Okay? So that's the fundamental idea. And so what we say is we don't explain, in most macro models, you explain exposed, how did you reach a new equilibrium? What we're saying is this is how you went there. Okay, so, so in a way we're time founding the dynamics of our model. We're trying to explain how because in certain markets it's price that are moving faster or in other markets it's quantity that are moving faster, the overall dynamics will depend on, on these, this kind of approach. That's important on the real side, but it's fundamental on the financial side. And, and this is what we do also in the market, in the foreign currency market disequilibrium where, again, if you think about your mac typical macro model, either you have a flix, uh, fixed exchange rate, so reserves will clear the market, or you have a flexible exchange rate and reserves don't change and it's the exchange rate that does the, the clearing the market. We are doing the two again at the same time. So you have a demand for foreign currency which is coming from imports and all the interest payments and maybe a bank desire to hold foreign reserves. And then you have a supply of effects coming from the exports, the financial flows coming into the economy, uh, you borrowing and then maybe a central bank intervention. But at the same time, so we're saying, okay, the exchange rate dynamics, the currency will appreciate if there is, sorry, depreciate if there is more demand than supply, or the other way, in, or other way around, the currency will uh, depre appreciate if there is more supply than effects, sorry, more supply of effects than demand of effects. So you have your exchange rate dynamics, but at the same time, you also have a, 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 a reserves currency, a reserve foreign currency a clearing mechanism where you ensure that the current account, the, sorry, the balance of payment is, is equilibrated, okay? So the two dynamics at the same time, and that's fundamental. To give again an example of the case of Colombia, um, in the case of Colombia, you have a currency which is depreciating and at the same time accumulating reserves. And that shouldn't happen. If you think about your macroeconomic theory, if a currency is depreciating, that means there is not enough reserves coming into the economy, hence you should not have accumulation of reserves. In the case of Colombia, what happens is that the currency is depreciating, but because banks want to invest abroad, they want to hold more reserves that they can actually get. So this is why they have reserve, they have an accumulation of reserves, but not enough to what they would like to. And this is why you have depreciation. But if you, if you have a model that is only fixed exchange rate or fixed, uh, well, the typical uh, approach to, to, to macro modeling, you will not be able to represent this kind of dynamics. And so this is why it's really important to understand, and this is, I'm, I'm trying to convince you that they, this, this, this equilibrium approach, this stock flow consistent approach, and this monetary approach, all of them combined allow us to understand what we think is relevant, for example, in the case of exchange rate dynamics. So in the model we have, we have exogenous dynamics coming from the financial and real global, global, uh, global cycle, which is not modeled in the, in the model. This is something we'll have as a scenario. Foreign inflation, again, is also not modeled. And then the combination of these two exogenous dynamics with endogenous dynamics, such as the arbitrage decision by foreign investors, the, the domestic policy rate by the central bank, um, will then explain and we can then show the mechanism by which all of them are interacting to lead to, over, uh, to do overall dynamics of the exchange rate. So you can see that in our model, we really have this causality structure, which is very important to understand aggregate dynamics. And, and, and this is why I'm saying that we are really interested not in the exposed situation. We're really trying to understand how do we get there. And, and these kind of causality graphs are fundamental uh, uh, there. Let me just go now to the, to the, to the, and I will have to be extremely fast, um, uh, to the continuous time. Why do we work in continuous time? So I said, we work with disequilibrium, we work with SFC, we work with monetary, and we work with continuous time. And the reason is that, fundamentally, I explained the importance, the importance of the speeds, right? I was saying, well, you have a disequilibrium, you have a, a mechanism by, by which there's a response on the quantity or on the, on the pricing. Well, what is important is to understand which one goes faster and can we represent the, the minimum time it needs for the thing to react. And so if you work, let's say, in, and you're interested in consumption decision, consumption decision is usually quite slow to move, right? You people are used, they, 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 so it takes time for them to respond to a change. I mean, we saw it, well, inflation was not a good example, but we saw it in other cases where there's a lot of inertia with consumption. 
So in that case, the characteristic time of consumption change is probably three to six months. Investment is a bit different. Investment reacts a bit, a bit, a bit faster. But financial investment is even faster. It's actually daily, right? So you have to have, if you want to represent correctly this mechanism by which the dynamics change, you have to have a model that actually has a very, sl uh, very short characteristic time. You want to have something that is moving daily or monthly. And if you have discrete model, it's complicated to do that because you don't have daily data. When you work in continuous time, you can use daily data with annual data to, ca to calibrate your model. And so you have this kind of, you, are, you don't have a characteristic time anymore because it's instantaneous change. It's, it's, it's you know, you're using uh, partial derivative, you're using time derivative. So it's the immediate change. And then this immediate change can be slow or fast depending on the characteristic time of the disequilibrium mechanism. So this is why we work in continuous time. And we actually, there's a lot of other mathematical properties of this, but fundamentally, we have to have this beta x that actually changes as fast as possible. The second thing is that when you look at uh, 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 low frequency data, and this is here, for example, the, the exchange rate between the, the, the Turkish Lira and the USD, you see that this is the quarterly data points. And between these two points and these two points, you have the same depreciation, but then what happened in between is fundamental. And sometimes you will have a large depreciation or a flash crash, which will have tremendous impact because that people will stop investing or because they have, have a strong relationship, but you don't see it in the quarterly data. So that's why you want to be able to work as much as possible with high frequency data. Hence, you really have to have a model that actually allows to be able to eat this kind of data. And that's not possible when you have like annual data or quarterly model. Finally, uh, you have like the, 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 these models allow us to really understand the interactions between all of these models and, and this is some, uh, th 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 all of these variables. And this is something which is very important for me as a, as a modeler. We can construct this kind of causality loops that says, okay, oh, something happens here and then I can track down all of the mechanism and all of the channels by which the change in the world interest rate leads to a boom bust dynamics. And again, the, we can do this because the causality is fundamental in the model, in the, in the GEM model, because the, 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 there is a causal structure which is explicit in the model. When you work again in, in, in typical macro model, uh, discrete time, you just explain what happened after one period. You don't explain how it happens. And, and this is why we spend a lot of time on our models to try to understand how things change. Why an uh, inflationary response will lead to an exchange rate reversal in our boom bust dynamics. So, so you really have this kind of work where we try to explicit as much as possible the mechanism by which all of the variable evolve through time. I won't go into, into too much. I'll, I'll try to give you 10 more minutes on country cases. That's, that's, I still have 10 minutes. OK. Right, so I said that these are the countries. Uh, let me talk about, yeah, I talked about this already. Um, so these are the different uh, countries in which we worked. Uh, we have like, for example, here, this is an energy model. Uh, Tunisia is with crop models. Colombia is, uh, we have a simple model and then we have a coupling with energy scope on, on energy and, and we're starting to work on crop models. Uh, Turkey, energy modeling. Mexico, energy transition and climate damages. India, energy. Morocco, we have a LPGML, which is a, a hydro crop uh, model, which is very interesting, um, and trying to understand the, the case of uh, uh, hydric stress, and Vietnam is, is uh, also with uh, energy model. How does it work? Let's take the case of Tunisia, which is very interesting. So Tunisia basically has a focus on what happens when climate change evolves and what are the consequences on the yield of crop production. Okay, so we try to understand whether hydric stress, which is coming out of climate change, will impact the production of different types of goods, agricultural goods. And what they did is they looked at all of these type of uh, products and they say, OK, what is the difference between a scenario when there is no climate change and a scenario when you have climate change? And you look at the change in yield. 
Okay, and so of course uh, in the baseline we see that most of the crops will, or all of the crops actually will have an increase in yield productivity, but with climate change actually a lot of them will lose productivity. Okay, so, so you have a loss of production and then we try to understand, okay, what are the consequences of this loss of production in the case of a climate change with domestic demand of agricultural production and with exports and imports. Okay, so that's the, the, and they do that for all of these different types of crops, then they aggregate them, and then they look at the consequences in terms of, for the food industry, which is in the, in the non-financial sector, the fact that there is no production in agriculture will have impact on the food industry, and if there's impact on the food industry, it's going to have impact on households, income, and on household consumption, and so on and so forth. So you have an, an all, then the rest of the model will respond to these fundamental scenarios of agricultural production, out of these uh, uh, multi-sectoral uh, multi and, and multi-good uh, production structure. <coughs> so what you see is that, again, we have a biophysical representation of the evolution of production at the good level, <coughs> and then we feed that into the macro dynamics of the model, and then see how all of these interactions play a role in explaining the aggregate dynamics of the, of the country. I won't go into too much details in this, but fundamentally what we show is that the fact that there is loss of production in agriculture it has a strong negative impact on the economy through food inflation because they import. Uh, uh, what happens is that when you don't produce domestically, then they have to import them and that's more expensive. Impact on unemployment. Uh, agriculture is a good, uh, is an important share of employment in, in, in the country. On the current account, as explained, strong loss of exports, but also strong increase in imports. And of course, it will lead to uh, uh, sustainability of public debt issues. And if climate change also has impact on lower global economic growth and higher global food price, these will be even magnified. Colombia, uh, Tunisia is well aware of these uh, risks and they have started to design policies which will try to eliminate negative climate impacts on agriculture, but these are very costly. Uh, and, so, and there is some sort of a trade-off that fundamentally there's a risk of instability coming from climate change, but even if you do implement these adaptation policies, maybe the cost of them is too large, which will nonetheless create instability dynamics, especially on the balance of, on the public debt uh, sustainability, but also on the current account, because you have to import all of the technologies to adapt to climate change. So, so it is fundamental to have low cost concessional foreign currency loans to mitigate part of this negative impact of investment in adaptation policies. Uh, but it's not sufficient, and you need to also work, and again, this is something that Tunisia knows, uh, you need to work on the increase in productivity of agricultural production uh, uh, to, to remove food insecurity and avoid long-term balances of payment. And the paper is, is available online. I will skip the energy modeling to go directly, uh, maybe not, sorry. Something else we did uh, in the case of uh, uh, Morocco is we coupled our model with LEAP. LEAP is an energy model that looks at energy vector by energy vector, what kind of investment do you need to go to net zero? So it can say uh, you will have to have 2.4 million cars, electric vehicles, you will have to have uh, 25 gigawatts of photovoltaic cell, you will need to reduce the emissions of cement industry by implementing this, this new technology and so on and so forth. So we have a very large detailed investment strategy that re allows Morocco to reach net zero. And then what we're saying is, what are the consequences from a macroeconomic perspective of these kind of investment? And we can show that, for example, in the case of Morocco, because they are dependent on imports of fossil fuel, the investment in the low carbon transition is actually beneficial quite fast because you stop importing all of these fossil fuel. So economically, it's interesting, mostly because you don't have to import. Uh, and when we show that, that using a, a first approximation that, that the GDP will grow um, faster than in the, in the no transition scenario, leading to per capita income and leading, uh, sorry, leading to consumption increase and leading to more employment. However, there's issues about trade balance. Because as, as I was saying, you, you reduce your imports, but at the beginning you have to increase your import because you have to import all of the electric cars, you have to import most of the photovoltaic cell, and so on and so forth. So the trade balance in the net zero, which is this yellow line, is actually worse at the beginning. And you have to say, how are you going to finance this trade balance deficit at the beginning? Afterwards, as you, stop, as you start losing your imports of fossil fuel, then the situation improves. 
So, so there is uh, a trade balance issue that needs to be sorted there, uh, and this is something we have to design on the new scenarios. We haven't finished this. There's a bit of inflationary risk, mostly because um, uh, there's a, the the Currently, Morocco is uh, producing using coal, and they will have to phase out earlier the coal uh, 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 electricity producers, and that is costly. So, so we have to uh, take into consideration the fact that the earlier retirement of the of the coal in this, the coal uh, electricity producers uh, might have a bit of inflationary risk. In terms of fiscal sustainability, when we looked at the at the receipts that would come from a, a carbon tax. They look to be much higher than, than the cost of the transition. Um, but the problem is that the carbon tax, whether it's efficient or not, is a different question. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it still represents a few percentage of uh, uh, GDP of investment. And that implies that you need to, pri to mobilize private finance. And that's an ambitious uh, goal for Morocco. And by the way, this work was presented at the COP uh, just last week. Let me finish with the case of Colombia, um, because, because it's fun. Uh, but also because I think it's an interesting, an interesting story. Okay, so when you look at climate risk story, uh, usually when we talk about climate risk and stranded assets, you look at the, at the individual firm level, right? You look at the climate risk for a bank, you look at the climate risk for a, for a firm. But, uh, and so they, they focus on what we call, we call idiosyncratic risk. So risk for individual entities. What we are claiming in this work and other work is that in the case of developing and emerging economies, the macro stability is as important as the indi individual stability. So climate risk will come mostly from the fact that you will have exchange rate depreciation in the case of a global transition. They will come from public instability because the government is not able to invest as much as it wanted or because it's running too much of a deficit. And actually, unfortunately, we are proven right because right now, the reason why many countries do not engage in a low carbon transition is mostly because they already are heavily indebted after COVID. And so the question is, how do you, how do you change that? So, so our work is trying to characterize macro climate risks, not individual idiosyncratic risk, but macro uh, uh, climate risk. And uh, how this macro financial context will then feed back onto these uh, uh, individual risks. And that's also part of the work we're doing with the Central Bank of Mexico. All right, very quickly, Colombia. Uh, Colombia is uh, very dependent on, on, on uh, fossil fuel exports when you see, well, tourism, but, one, uh, but also fossil fuel uh, here. Uh, and it doesn't really export other stuff or it's, it's very low complexity goods. On the other hand, when you look at the import, this is really the export basket, but when you look at the import basket, they import pretty much everything. So Colombia has a very literally, uh, well, low developed industrial uh, uh, network, very much dependent on basic goods, tourism, petrol, uh, coal, uh, and then a bit of food. On top of it, uh, there's ex Colombia is really a case study for uh, a Dutch disease, so low investment, because of the, the Dutch disease effect, uh, lots of dependency to, to, uh, on FDI going towards uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the mining industry. Uh, so premature, uh, premature signs of deindustrialization, Dutch disease actually combined with the financial Dutch disease. Even though Colombia is exporting a lot of coal, its current account is still heavily negative. Uh, both in terms of the trade, but also in terms of, of uh, factors of payment. So, so the, the currency is basically drugged on foreign currency uh, income through financial flows, FDI and, and other. Um, and so uh, you can see lots of, uh, lots of FDI, uh, a bit of portfolio, portfolio flows, uh, and a bit of derivatives. But, but fundamentally, a lot of financial flows coming into the economy. And as I was saying, lots of financial flows coming into the economy, and yet depreciation. Uh, still happening. And what we're trying to do is what happens if uh, Colombia starts losing exports of fossil fuel. And there's two reasons why Colombia might be losing fossil fuel exports. On the one hand, uh, Colombia has left uh, seven years left of uh, petrol reserves. So, so it's not so much that there will, there will not be a demand, international demand uh, on, foreign res uh, on, fossil, uh, on petrol. It's really about the fact that Colombia doesn't have current uh, reserves and interestingly, and I think rightly, has pledged not to do further exploration of uh, fossil fuel. And Petro, again, in Colum in, during the COP was, was uh, being very strong on saying we have to get out of this fossil fuel dependency, which is risky. We'll see why. So 
oil exports really about demand and the fact that domestic demand and the fact that there's little reserves. Coal exports, that's really about global transition. Coal is really the bad guy in the transition. It should, gas should be there as well, but it's really coal. And so here it really depends on what the world will do. Colombia has lots of coal, uh, good quality, so it's really about international demand. And so here we, we, we surveyed the literature and looked at the different scenarios that exist and, and designed two scenarios. One scenario, no, sorry, three scenarios. One scenario when there is no loss of fossil fuel exports, no growth, but no loss. In real terms, one scenario, which is what we call conservative, which is a slight decline in fossil fuel export in constant terms, and then one global transition scenario, which is like the 1.5 or 2 degree scenario, where there's a massive decline in fossil fuel exports in constant terms. Then we add the, 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 the inflation, and so this is in current uh, USD. Um, and then we calibrated the model. Uh, we also have some scenarios on the on, on uh, exogenous variables. We, we won't discuss this because uh, we, we're short on time, but we can discuss afterwards. Um, we test the model with uh, the forecast by the Ministry of Finance. And what we show is that fundamentally we agree on the baseline. So we have similar real GDP growth rate, uh, unemployment rate, trade balance, inflation, nominal depreciation, current account deficit. So, so basically our model is not completely stupid at least compared to Hacienda's uh, model. Maybe the two of us are stupid, but then it's a problem for everyone else. Um, same dynamics in terms of the financial side, so, so we, we quite agree on, on many things. We compared, we tried to also understand whether it makes sense, because if, if the two models are saying the same thing, then maybe you just need one model. So we compared the two models and we, do, we did two scenarios, well actually we did, Hacienda proposed two scenarios and we used them. So they say, okay, what happens if you have higher FDI growth rate? And what happens if you have higher export growth rate? And we model the same shocks to our scenarios and well, same long run impacts in FDI growth rate and export growth rate. And we look at the consequences on real GDP growth rate and nominal depreciation. And so what we see is that in our case, the impacts of exports is, and, and actually FDI are of the same uh, uh, sign. So both of them lead to higher growth rate, but the, the magnitude is very little in the case of the FDI shock, and it's, it's lower in the case of the uh, export shock. So, so our model is predicting the same kind of, qualitatively the same kind of impact, impact but not the same magnitude. Why is that? Well, it's, it, it has to do with the fact that in our model, the depreciation rate is endogenous. So as you increase your export, it reduces the depreciation pressure on the currency. So your currency stop being at 2% depreciation, it declines, the depreciation rate declines. But as you have less depreciation, you have more imports because imports become cheaper. And so, so fundamentally, Part of the, the loss of, the, no, no, well, sorry, part of the fact that the multiplier effect is lower is because we have endogenous nominal effects. So this is why we think it's important to have this kind of finan real financial uh, uh, models is because you want to understand how something which is really on, well, the FDI is not on the, re on the real side, but exports are on the real side, have an impact on the financial side, and hence has an impact on the real GDP growth. Right, okay, very quickly, what are the consequences for Colombia in terms of global transition dynamics? Well, it's not good, simply. GDP starts declining, uh, lots of, uh, yeah, sorry, exchange rate uh, starts depreciating very, very strongly. Inflation comes into play, uh, both in terms of production inflation, but consum consumer inflation, uh, consumption uh, declines as a share of GDP, investment declines as a share of GDP. That's at the beginning. And then at some point you see that it, there's, a, there's a decline in regrowth and then it, 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 it spurs back and that's a limitation of our model. What happens is that there's a strong depreciation and because there's a strong depreciation, the trade balance recovers. So exports are increasing and imports are declining. That we don't believe it's really gonna happen. The problem is it's extremely complicated to represent that. But fundamentally, you cannot say that because you have depreciation, export will increase directly because what happens is that you need to have the capacity to increase your exports. And as we have seen, Colombia exports coal and fruits and vegetables. You can't grow more fruits and vegetables immediately because your currency has depreciated. So you need to have the capacity to export. So here, the model mechanically shows that, but actually we think that, that what would happen is probably a lower growth rate emerging in the long run. But the model, we couldn't change that. Uh, right, so, so unemployment increases and so on and so forth. 
I won't go into too much detail. I'll, I'll quickly uh, finish here. What is important so, is that, yeah, sorry. So because of the recovery, then the GDP growth rate starts going back to its original level. Um, and so it looks like the, co the, the country is actually in decent shape, right? So yeah, there was a crisis. OK, it was complicated, inflation, whatnot. But the public debt has increased. The fiscal deficit has increased. OK, so it's not a nice story. But actually, it's a very bad story. Because when you look at the per capita income in USD, which is fundamental, you have to take into consideration that many of the important goods, such as health goods, but also cars, uh, cell phones, laptops, are imported. And they are imported in US dollars. So as your currency depreciates strongly, the cost of these goods have become immensely important. And that's what we represent here. What we show is that the per capita income in USD declines and does not recover for 20 years. That implies that there will be a strong poverty impact on the population. And actually, knowing the fact that Colombia is extremely unequal, you know that those who will suffer are not the richest part of the population. Probably they are being paid in USD. They don't care. What happens is that most of the population that is paid in peso will not have access to basic services because you simply cannot import them. We also show that it's possible that, that the currency, could, the Colombia could go in a currency crisis. Uh, it depends on, on some of the characterization of the export response, but we, we are showing that it's possible that you have a massive uh, uh, currency crisis and, and basically uh, having a, a lost decade again. Uh, and then, because we didn't want to have only a depressive paper, we said, okay, but there's, maybe there's a way out. And that's when we have the magical thinking of, let's assume Colombia can diversify its exports. And that's a big assumption. But if Colombia manages to uh, diversify its exports, then yeah, it can mitigate part of the, of the impact, but it takes time. And so if we look back uh, at the per capita income in USD, what we show is that when you do have investment-driven uh, export diversification, you can mitigate the impacts, but it still takes 15 years instead of 25 years to recover. So the, the policy conclusion is that Colombia is right in anticipating as much as possible the, de the, 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 de the decline of uh, uh, fossil fuel exports. It should start diversifying right now. It's not, fa it's not easy. It's quite complicated, actually. Um, but, but as soon as possible, given the time it takes anyway to respond to that kind of shock, Starting as soon as possible is good. And so to, to some extent, this is why the position of Petro is interesting, the president of Colombia is interesting, because even though he knows that by saying, let's stop exporting fossil fuel, it's, he's shooting himself in the foot, but also he knows that by doing this right now and forcing Colombia to get, to get out of this dependency of fossil fuel, it will help in mitigating the negative impact that will come nonetheless uh, in the case of a global transition. All right, so what did we do? We have this SFC model for Colombia. It's, it's showing the importance of, current, of considering both the current account and the financial account in their interaction. Colombia is facing serious challenges. Uh, we have an optimistic uh, uh, specification because of the Armington specification in exports. The export diversification can help taming the outcome, but it's slow and needs to start as soon as possible. And of course, financial flow can also reduce currency tensions. And um, yeah, I'll stop this because there's lots of slides more. But why should you use SFC modeling? Well, I think it's because you really want to understand the interaction between the real side and the financial flow side. A, a situation which might look sustainable is actually, might actually lead to imbalances building up and having an unsustainable situation in the long run. As Minsky was saying, uh, st uh, stability is destabilizing. Uh, you have to understand the interaction between the financial side and the real side. Uh, in the case of transition, understanding how imbalances shape the, the dynamics is very important. There's a lot of space and need for policy intervention uh, uh, in the case of uh, transitions. And so, so there's a lot of instability that might come of it. And this is why you should have this equilibrium modeling uh, uh, in there. And uh, yeah, and this is just what, why, why GEM is uh, special. Well, because we co-construct. And so this is, I didn't spend too much time on this, but we actually are working hand in hand with uh, the Ministry of Finance, the uh, DNP in Colombia, with the Ministry of Finance in Morocco, with the Ministry of Environment in, in Vietnam and so on and so forth. Uh, and we are building models that are relevant for the question that are important for developing and emerging economies. And one hour and four minutes, I think that's enough. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>